One minute. Oh, no, nope, six o'clock now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give him, give him, give uh, Dr. Michael Blanchard another few seconds and. All right, there we go. There he is. There he is. Okay. Hey, Doc, I've been I've been out of commission, brother Cleek, for like uh like almost a year, man. I've been on hiatus, <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Doctor Wallace, to tell you. So I'm having some some technical challenges here. I got to get back into it, man. That's all right. We all have technical challenges because the technology <laughs> keeps changing and we got to keep yeah. updating ourselves and all that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, welcome to your to our live broadcast. I'm your host, Dr. Cleet Ladd. I am a retired language arts and social studies teacher and public school principal. I am currently an associate professor with the University of Phoenix College of Education I am also CEO of Mail Incorporated Rights of Passage Initiative and co-director of engagement and community outreach for Indiana Council on Educating Students of Color. The mission of our show is to connect local, state, national, and international leaders with you, the listener, to discuss education, equity, and its many, many intersections. I always begin by saying Watoto VP. Watoto VP is Kiswahili for how are the children? And our children, some are well, some are not well. So today we're having a woke conversation. With us live are my dear friend, Dr. Michael Blanchard, who is a former IMPD officer for our local connection. Dr. Blanchard is a passionate advocate for black liberation. He's a strong believer in the power of education and, and community to create change. He is committed to using his voice and platform to raise awareness, about the challenges facing Black people in America. Dr. Blanchard is a thought-provoking and insightful writer. His work is both challenging and inspiring. He has a valuable voice in the fight for Black liberation. Here are some of Dr. Blanchard's accomplishments. He's author of several books, including The Black Book of Lamentations and a Community Research Guide to Students' Persistence. He is co-host and co-producer of the podcast, The Teachers, He's a graduate of Indiana Wesleyan University and Indiana University Bloomington. He holds a doctorate in education from the University of New England. He has taught at the college and high school levels, worked in the field of security, education, and law enforcement. He's a passionate advocate for black liberation, a strong believer in the power of education and community to create change, committed to using his voice and platform to raise awareness about the challenges facing black people in America. He is also a thought provoking an insightful writer and a valuable voice in the fight for black liberation. In addition to his work as an author, educator, and researcher, Dr. Blanchard is also a frequent speaker at conferences and events on the topic of black liberation. He's a regular contributor to several online and print publications. He's a passionate advocate for social justice and equality and equity for all people. Dr. Blanchard is a respected and influential figure in the black community. He has, his work has had a significant impact on the fight for black liberation. He is a powerful voice for change and he is committed to using his platform to make a difference in the world. 
Dr. Blanchard is uh, his most recent work, the Black Book, Book of Limitations, was uh, published in 2021. A community research guide to students persisted in 2022. Our current security protocols, the best use of funds in public schools, 2021. The Teachers Podcast, 2021 through present, and the Teachers Music Video and Track. Dr. Blanchard is a prolific writer and researcher. He is constantly working on new projects and he is always looking for ways to use his voice to make a difference in the world. He is a valuable asset to the black community and he is a powerful force for change. Thank you. Welcome Dr. Blanchard. Hey, thanks for having me, Brother Cleet. And also we have an, another outstanding guest. Dr. Rick Wallace holds dual doctor degrees in theology and psychology. He's recognized internationally for his work in performance psychology and trauma, healing with patients, with clients in Europe, Africa, Australia, Canada, and the Caribbean. In addition to his academic successes, Dr. Wallace has experienced a great deal of business success over the past 35 years. He has founded, launched, and brought more than 47 companies to profitability. He's the current founder and CEO of Rick Wallace Enterprises, which includes subsidiaries like the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group and Publishing, Master Fitness 21, the Financial Brain Trust, Myriad Business Solutions, and more. In addition to his work through the Odyssey Project, Dr. Wallace has contributed to many charitable endeavors. His passion for saving young black boys is revealed in the Black, Lead, black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative, a program created to fill the gap of missing fathers in black communities. Black Men Lead is designed to effectively and appropriately racially socialize young black boys, reducing their proclivity toward violence, lower dropout rates and incarceration, and increasing their chances <clears throat> of success in society. He is a leader in research surrounding the, the, the enigmatic issues plaguing the black community and continues to be an international leader in healing trauma. Dr. Wallace is a leading mind and voice regarding multi-generational trauma, epigenetics and complex trauma. Dr. Wallace is also an author and has published 26 books, including his latest work, Transcendent, the remarkable, the remarkable Ability to Rise Above the Chaos to Win in Life, The War on Black Wealth, Academic Apartheid, Critical Mass, The Phenomenon, phenomenon of Next Level Living, Born in Captivity, psycho, Psychopathology and as a Legacy of Slavery. The Undoing of the African American Mind and the Miseducation of Black Youth in America. He has written and published thousands of scholarly and prose articles and papers with the overwhelmingly majority of his work surrounding the, the enigmatic issues plaguing Blacks in inner city communities on every level. Papers that he has published include special education on the mechanism as the mechanism for miseducation of African youth, racial trauma in African Americans, epigenetics in psychology, the genetic intergenerational transmission of trauma in African-Americans and collective cognitive bias reality syndrome, just to name a few. Dr. Wallace is also a powerful and electrifying public speaker who speaks to various types and sizes of audiences on several subjects. <clears throat> he also functions as a personal life enhancement advisor, life strategist, consultant, and counselor. Welcome to, welcome to join us, uh, uh, Dr. Rick Wallace. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's kind of just kind of just jump in. Uh, I want to uh, uh, kind of ask Dr. Wallace uh, a couple of couple of questions to get us started. And uh, can you explain some of the psychological trauma impact impacting Black students' test scores, academic and social success? <clears throat> well, uh, when we talk about Black students, we have to talk about initially. Uh, cultural influences. And I think one of the things that we fail in this particular educational structure is understanding the differences in culture. When you have a teacher population in K through 12 that is predominantly white mid middle-aged female, uh, when you, especially with young black boys, what you're gonna encounter is an indifference that is apathetic by the teacher and there's a disproportionality of special education referrals uh, that ultimately end up in alienation of the child. We hear all the time about the school to prison pipeline. This is one of the ways it's initiated through the alienation of African-American males. Uh, I mean, as early as five years old, these young boys are going to be referred for special education because they don't sit still, because they talk out of turn, because they do all things that five-year-olds do 
uh, but they're probably going to do it in a more amplified manner, which can be directly linked to what's going on at home. Uh, I just did uh, in February a workshop on epigenetics and adverse childhood experiences and uh, that impact uh, child children. <laughs> and it's disproportionately impacting African-Americans. And so when you take that and you couple it with a situation where you're putting a child in an environment, asking them to do something that is biologically and neurolo neurologically out of turn, be still for an hour, hold your volume down for an hour. That's not how children that age learn. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're asking him to do it without any consideration to what's going on in the home. So when you start talking about trauma, there are probably different types of trauma happening in home because we're still living trauma because we haven't dealt with the generational trauma. So even when we think we're parenting well and we got a good environment, there's probably trauma. And so then he takes that to school and he's in a culture now that he's not familiar with because the culture wasn't created for him. So he's out of place. He's agitated. And the same thing with our young daughters, which go into a world where they are now challenged on everything from their beauty to their class, uh, to how they carry themselves, to uh, everything uh, down to vernacular. And so you talk about trauma. It, it, I could go on for days talking about different things. But the biggest thing I see in trauma and it probably wouldn't even on a regular scale be associated with academia. Uh, but the biggest educational issue I see with trauma is identity. When you walk off into a situation where you're rep you're not represented properly, uh, the optics don't represent you, and then you're expected to acclimate to it. The acclimation, if you're not careful, the acclimation will actually lead you to abandonment of self. And in doing so, you now you're dealing with self-esteem issues, self-confidence issues, and, and, and on and on. I hope you know that gave you. That's a that's a a, a, a beautiful and very enlightening explanation. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, about two months ago, I did a presentation at Decatur Central High School, which uh, has uh, bust in you know over the years had bust in some black students, and I was talking about African American heroes and sheroes, especially African American women heroes. And I told the teachers, I wanted them to watch the black, I mean, the white male's response to learning about black female heroes. And the white, the teachers noticed that the white males were not paying attention, were talking, were interrupting, and were playing and tagging with each other. And I told them, I said, this is, you know, because this is not interested them. They don't see themselves. When the white males don't see themselves, they disconnect. And this is the same thing that happens when black males and black females don't see themselves. And so I think you, you, you kind of uh, alluded to that when you're talking about identity. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Dr. Michael Blanchard, I, I know that that you kind of see that there's a connection and a disconnection between scholars and grassroots activists regarding schools not serving black students and helping black students pass state assessments and successfully navigating the current educational landscape. Landscape. Can you kind of talk about that connection and disconnection? Uh, how that, how we can uh, kind of bridge this gap so our, our students can can work and be successful. Yeah, I think um, both scholars and grassroots activists agree that schools are not doing enough to serve our kids. And I think, um, you know, it points to the fact that black students are disproportionately likely to enroll in, in low, low performing schools and to be suspended and to be expelled and to be dropouts. Um, so we're all in agreement to that. But the disconnect, uh, that's the connection, you know. The disconnect is what do we do about it? Um, uh, you know, because scholars tend to focus on uh, structural factors that contribute to educational disparities faced by black students. Uh, grassroots people focus on the everyday experiences of black students. And so we need to have the right people uh, dealing with our kids. You know, we all talk about wraparound services, Dr. Wallace and I, talk about wraparound services, you and I talk about wraparound services. We have, I, I really honestly believe we have the, the necessary grassroots people and scholars to, 
to actually work together to, um, mm -hmm. to deal with these uh, problems in our schools, increasing violence, uh, increasing uh, bomb threats by students, increasing violence with students uh, calling schools and say they're going to shoot it up. You know, uh, I work down here in Florida, as you know, in the sixth largest uh, school district. And one of the things that I noticed down here when I first started working here in 2019 that was different about Indianapolis and South Bend, where I'm from, I could not believe the number of, of kids that are Baker Acted. And, you know, Baker Acted means when you're taken in for mental health evaluation. I mean, mm -hmm. literally every day, uh, Dr. Cleet, you know, to see that there are at least five to 10 a day. Those types of things I didn't see when I lived in Indianapolis. 15 years. I didn't see, I don't know whether you saw it, but I don't think we had that type of, um, of mental health crisis um, uh, in, in Indiana. And I still don't think it's that high now. Um, you know, but down here in South Florida, there's some kind of dynamic going on uh, where that is happening. And, and I don't know how the rest of the country pairs out in that, but those are the type of things that, that um, we have to deal with and get the right people into our schools and it's very difficult for people uh, like you and, 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 and uh, Dr. Rick Wallace that's on our program and even, uh, you know, Sister Lateva, you know, uh, she mm -hmm. has very good programs um, that could actually help our young people uh, navigate the school system uh, that's needed. But unfortunately, it's very difficult for them to get in as, as vendors and in, in, in major school district. But, but they have the answers. It's just a matter of them uh, being given the opportunity. Yeah, one of the vendors uh, we, we've been blessed is with the Indiana Council on Educating Students of Color, but it's in an after school program. And so it focuses on reading, uh, you know, helping the, the literacy part about reading and then the test part. But, but uh, I, I want to kind of pose this question to you because, to both of you, because uh, from my experience, I've seen students bring trauma from home and not care about the test. And then I've also seen them have test anxiety because the teachers, uh, all you got, you know, we, 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 they're training for the test and they're not really learning the, the, the curriculum or the content. Right, you're talking about the dynamic of teaching to the test rather than uh, making sure the, 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 the student actually grasps the knowledge. Yes. And, and that, that is a major problem, teaching to the test um, and, and Dr. Rick can speak to this a lot. You know, everything is tied to that test, not only for the student, but it's also tied to the teacher, whether the teacher is, is effective or not. So, you know, we got to get away from teaching to the test and we got to we, we have to get in a position to where we can actually uh, measure whether the kid is educated, you know, and we can mm -hmm. talk about what education means. Is it is it simply passing a test? Or is it the mastering of that knowledge? You know, it's two different things. Wow. Dr. Rick. Um, I agree 100% with, uh, with Dr. Blanchard on that. I think one of the things that I think we have to center around, when I wrote uh, The Miseducation of Black Youth, which was my 16th book, one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to define education in a sense of what it means to advance one or to advance uh, a group of people. And education has to be seen as more than simply the accumulation or the acquisition of uh, academic skill sets. Uh, to me, uh, education begins with the centering of identity. If a, if a kid doesn't know who he is, you can give him all the skills in the world and he'll still be misled, misguided, exploited, mishandled and misused. So I define education as the empowerment and preparation of youth to develop a capacity to go out into the world as adults and not only compete, but win. And so it starts with identity. It starts with a sense of self. Without Everything you do is based on your self-concept, your self-image. And if you go out into a situation where we haven't properly socialized the child, the child doesn't know who he is, a young black male is still searching for self. What happens is he's going to get into an environment where he's not recognized, where he's not acknowledged, where he's marginalized. And in order to be accepted, he's either going to fight to be accepted, which means sets down who he really thinks he is because he doesn't look or feel or fit in, but he wants to. Everybody wants to be accepted. It's a natural social 
push and desire within our makeup. But what happens is, is when you put him in an environment where the vast majority of the people who are going to be judging him and secondary label givers next to his parents, they're going to have an influence. So if he doesn't know before he leaves home who he is, he's going to struggle. Why? Because the vast majority of stimuli that he's going to come in contact with isn't going to support who he is at home or who he sees or desires or wants to be early in life. And then when he gets to the age of 13, 14, and 15, then there comes another problem. And we see this in the outline of the dropout rate, which leads to a higher incarceration rate. Statistics tell me that uh, if you drop out of high school before getting a diploma, you're four to five times more likely to become incarcerated. Well, right around the time these dropouts are happening, uh, black males are going through what all males go through. And that is the transition out of puberty uh, into adolescence and to a sense of natural self-discovery. At that age, every male, regardless of race, is searching for who they are in their faith, in their career aspirations, and how they carry themselves as a man, how manhood is defined, which is a struggle in the black community because we don't have a universal designation of what manhood is. Uh, that's why I created Black Man League to create that. But the more he struggles with that, the more disruptive he becomes because he's fighting. He's fighting and when he doesn't know what he's fighting, he fights everything. And so then you end up with hyperviolence, you end up with uh, criminal, crim uh, criminal mentality or criminal uh, activity, a bunch of other things that obviously lead him down a wrong path. And so self-discovery is so important and it needs to be initiated early on. So uh, again, like Dr. Uh, Blanchard said, uh, we, I think all agree that there's a problem uh, where the disconnect comes in is on what we should do about it and what do we define of it. And again, I agree 100 percent that we've got to move away from universal ideas as far as tests are concerned. These standardized tests, these ideas of teaching toward a test, uh, I think we need to spend more time on identifying gifts, identifying strengths, intellectual strengths natural artistic gifts, all the things that people can use in this world to create value and space for themselves. Uh, I think those are things that we need to need to do. It's things that uh, is, it's, it's not, it's, it's a universal thing. Everybody's taught to the same standard when everybody's not the same. Mm. And so when, and, and, and that's in learning and that's in performance as well. I think everybody in uh, having, you know, dealt with so many people over the course of my life and my career, I tell people all the time, I think everybody has a gift. I haven't, I've, I've dealt with people with learning disorders, oppositional defiant disorder, low IQs, uh, Down syndrome, ADHD, and everything else. And I've yet to meet a person without a gift. Uh, the problem is very few of the situations that we look at when we talk about education is searching out a gift. It's saying, this is what we're going to train you to do. So you fit into the system. And I think we've got to start teaching and training away from system and toward gift. Wow, yeah. I um, My my experience as, as an educator, I was with the alternative education department for about five years with the IPS. And it started out as a, uh, focusing on how students learn and students' interests and passions and gifts and talents. It ended up becoming a penal part of a penal system where if a student wasn't performing in, in a in the in the regular school, they were sentenced to alternative school, and so uh, my my uh, students started out. It was about 50 50 um, racially and 50 50 50 percent uh, uh, gender, but when they changed it to a penal system, it became about 90 percent black male. You know, and so one of the things that we learned about it that, that and I want you guys to to talk more about this as well is that. When you talk about identity and the movies and the, the media shows pimps, hustlers, athletes, but not engineers, not pilots, you know. Uh, and so then the, particularly the black male and then, and then for the black female, uh, maids, prostitutes, you know, things like that. Those are the images that they push in front uh, and they still do that. And I want you to kind of both of you uh, uh, just jump, just, just to jump in, kind of explain how those images help distort what a person's what a person can become, or they, or, or as they see it, their purposes in life. 
Dr. Blanchard, you want to go first? Well, the only thing I'll say about it is that, uh, you know, Dr. Rick has educated me about the importance of uh, socialization. And it's, it's just amazing that, that uh, we don't have socialization as part of the school curriculum uh, because mm -hmm. our students are not getting it. You know, they're not getting it at home. Um, you know, we tried the rites of passage programs. You know, those were real big in the last 20, 30 years to try to attempt to do that. And then also, you also have to have the right people teaching that socialization. So uh, to teaching the kids their, their identity, because many of us have, as adults, we don't, we don't have a good sense of self and identity ourselves. So, wow. you know, many of us just learned over the last 30 years, you know, I can remember <laughs> uh, living in Indianapolis uh, with you, Brother Cleet, and, and coming out of college at Indiana University and having no sense of self having no, no sense of identity. And uh, uh, living in Indianapolis was, was, was fertile ground for me, learning from brothers like you and several other brothers, you know, going to black bookstores and, and seeking it out, you know, coming out of Indiana University and, and saying, hey, I have a degree, but I don't know anything about myself. Hmm. So I started that journey, you know, way back in 1989 when I joined the Indianapolis Police Department. I would go to black bookstores, you know, during, during the time I was controlling and, and buy books and read in my spare time. And so it's interesting that you can go through uh, K through 12 and also four years of education and have, 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 do not have a sense of identity. Hmm. So it's, it, it's very important. You know, Dr. Rick can probably speak uh, uh, more eloquently than I can on it, but that's just my own personal experience. I mean, I knew nothing about myself you know when 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 i came out of south bend, south bend school uh uh community schools uh, and went on to indiana university man all i thought you know i got that, that, that you had slavery and you had the civil rights movement that was the that was the gist mm -hmm. of, of what i got you know and it seems like we're going back to that you know especially down here in florida where i'm at we're going back to that that, that, that that's the only thing they want to want to talk about and then uh we can't mention anything that that hurts folks feelings either you know we can't we can't do that either so mm. <laughs> well uh what, what what i want to do is give a real snap real quick snapshot of what we're talking about when we say socialization so for clarity every parent regardless of race socializes their kid regardless of race socialization is a sense of awareness this is who you are. This is what you can do. This is what you can't do. This is socially acceptable. This is not socially acceptable. You don't go in public and do this. You don't go in. When you go out, you say, yes, sir, no, ma'am. You shake someone's hands. You look in them in the eye, you all, all that. Then you tell them you're smart, you're beautiful, you're handsome, you can do anything. All that socialization. But we've all heard the term, if, we, if, 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 if uh, especially Blacks, we've heard the term racial socialization. So I'm often asked, what's the difference between socialization and racial socialization? Well, socialization, every parent does. Racial socialization is the double down because a, a Black parent understands the vast majority of stuff I just taught you about yourself that's positive, you're going to go out in the world and immediately meet opposing views. And so I've got to double down. So one of the things when I think about uh, racial socialization that I experience as myself is constantly being told as a young youth that you're going to have to be two to three times better than the average white person mm -hmm. to get the mm -hmm. same footing that they get. So, and then it will be followed with, but son, you are, you're that good that you can do whatever they can do. And you can do it three times better because you're going to have to. So it went out and I went out with an understanding that life, what isn't fair. And that's one of the first thing that I had to gain a grasp. It's not about how fair life is. It's about what you take and what you do with what you have. So that's the first step of it is this idea of, first of all, preparing children to go out into a world that all these views are opposing. Now, let's get to the question you ask about the imagery. The media controls the imagery and the media is controlled predominantly by six major figures in the world, 13,000 plus media outlets predominantly owned by six people. We won't call them what they are because I'm trying to keep you from getting kicked off and me from getting banned and a whole bunch of other <laughs> stuff, but we all know. So these six people control the narrative because the media controls the narrative. There's a book written in 1933 by a guy by the name of Edward Bernays, uh, who is the father of PR. And it's literally from Bernays' teachings that Hitler took the book 
of uh, propaganda, propaganda yeah. and created the movement that allowed him to do what he did and have the backing of the predominance of German citizens, because that's the power of propaganda. Uh, a black gentleman uh, wrote a book called uh, Brainwash, Tom, uh, Tom Burrell. Uh, he's the CEO emeritus of the largest black owned media company, uh, black owned uh, PR firm, excuse me. And he talks about how the media is used to send, create a negative image. Uh, I'll give you a prime example. Take six kids, three white kids, three black kids, 16 years old. They go to the mall, they shoplift. When they do the news report for the white kids, they're in their school picture. They do the, uh, the image of the black kids, they get their mug shot. And this is consistently sending an image. Everything that you see in the imagery is what? Criminalizing the black male image. Emasculate uh, uh, our or, or the flip side is the emasculation. It's either highly feminizing the black male image or criminalizing the black male image. And so when the, when the, it, it, what, what's so crazy about it, it's not just a little white old lady walking down the parking lot when you're walking towards the mall that gets all the way to the side. It's the black woman too, because she's bought into it. She's more afraid of you, even though the statistics says she's probably more of a threat with a white male than she is a black male. The imagery says otherwise. So when they see, and here's the problem. So when they see a black male shot down unarmed by a police officer, the natural uh, neurological processing of the brain, the, the subconscious says they probably did something to deserve it, even though they're not armed. And then uh, Norm Stamper, who is a former police chief, for San Diego and Seattle, if I'm not mistaken, wrote a book called Breaking Rank. And he broke rank. When I tell you, bro, he told everything. One of the things he wrote in that book, which was pretty interesting to me, is he said that white cops, while they will not admit it, have a natural innate fear of black men. And the darker the man and bigger the man, the bigger the fear. And so when they say they fear for their life, it's not a cop out it's literally they believe that black men are supernaturally more powerful and capable of killing them with their bad hands hmm. and where do you think they get that imagery from that imagery is constantly put out that we are naturally destructive we tear up everything when the truth of the matter is about 80 percent of the black male population are law are, 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 almost 90 percent are law abiding but about 80 percent perform at a standard above what anybody could ever imagine matter of fact a Pew Research uh, finding and a Kaiser uh, Research finding, both published and held by the CDC, says that black men are more uh, engaged as fathers than whites or Asians. So, but that's never going to be published. It's never going to be brought to the forefront because it doesn't meet the narrative. So, when you ask about this, what they see in imagery has a massive impact on what they interpret about themselves. If everything I see about myself is negative, if everything I see about the person who opposes me is positive, I literally start to believe they're better than me. Hmm. Wow. That's powerful. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to uh, take a little break here a second just to read uh, something about, um, for so we got some summer programs coming up. Uh, we have a library and book, uh, library book and art event coming up tomorrow at Glendale Library. Uh, we have uh, the uh, parents and community are invited to hear Magistrate Jeffrey Gaither. He's of the Marion County Superior Court on Education and Law and Artistic Virtuoso Angelita Hampton. Uh, then I, I want to share something with I just uh, came back from, uh, I, I, I gave several Juneteenth um, uh, presentations over the weekend and um, I met with Faye Williams, Faye, Faye Williams from Galveston, Texas, who talked about her family's history with regard to Juneteenth. And, uh, and I, we, we learned some things that uh, the proclamation around Juneteenth, such as the 13th Amendment, uh, freed all slaves, not just African, but also Chinese or Asian, also uh, uh, Latino. And so we, we tend to focus the slavery part Freeing the slaves is focused on black people, and so that you know when 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 Dr. Uh, Michael Blanchard talked about our history starts with slavery, <laughs> you know, and that's the image that they you know the shackled big black man shackled that you talked about, right. and so uh, I was really taken aback by that because that's that's what we hear all the time, 
And so, but you don't you don't see the Native American or the you know the indigenous uh, or the Chinese or the Latin people who were also enslaved and they were freed by the 13th Amendment as well. And then she talked about General Order Number 34. I'm mean, number three. And this, and this is from uh, uh, General uh, Gordon Granger read this in Galveston on June 19th, 1865, two years after the two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. It says the people are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection here to existing between them become, become that they be, be that become that between employer and hired labor. The free are advised to remain at their present homes and to work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and they will not be supported in, in idleness either there or elsewhere. This is general order number three. And, and so it talks about masters and slaves. It doesn't, it, it doesn't talk about people. It talks about statuses, you know. And so I think that well, uh, when you talk about how uh, our images and, 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 uh, and the, the media, they, they, they continue to, to uh, not prefer, to, to portray us as human beings, as people, but as former slaves or people, of, ancestors of, I mean, descendants of enslaved people. And they, they never talk about our Africanness, our connection to our African continents. And um, so I, I, when, I, when I was listening to her talk about this, and, and the, the Galveston was called the Island of Color. And uh, it, it, it kind of, it, it kind of uh, stained my wanting to celebrate Juneteenth, you know, because it doesn't talk about us as being human beings. It doesn't talk about us, uh, uh, you know, the, the media doesn't talk about our uh, contributions to America, to, you know, uh, becoming uh, people, human beings, as opposed to just free slaves. You know, you talk about that language, the propaganda language and stuff like that. So I just wanted to share that with you real quick. Um, but now let's let's get back to a, another uh, uh, question. Um, and this is uh, kind of about, about uh, um, I, I, I had, I was a, a dean at a school, uh, at school, I appeared 69 about seven years ago. And um, I kept getting these uh, these 14 black boys were kept coming to the, to my uh, office almost every day, the same 14 by the same teachers. And so then I, I, I talked to the, the boys, you know, I had them do, a, 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 had them draw some of their feelings, you know, and come to find out of the 14, nine of them had fathers who were murdered. Uh. And so I want you to kind of, you know, kind of talk about that trauma, uh, and then not having, you know, because we all, we, you know, I never met my father. My father passed when I was a teenager, and the first time I saw him was in his coffin. So I had no identity of who he was or who I could become. You talked about that. So kind of, kind of talk more about that trauma of, of black children, uh, their parents going to prison, or, or being killed or murdered. And they they're, them not having a relationship with their with their parents. Uh, well, I, I think we're seeing it play out. And I, I'm just going to say something real briefly, Doc. I see it playing out. You know, during the last four years that I've been uh, working in the field of school security, um, you can't even get to uh, the curriculum because you're having to deal with all the trauma, all the violence, all the dysfunction of the community is being brought to the school doorstep now because we as a society, both, uh, both the community, law enforcement, we've taken a position that uh, you know more police uh, is going to solve the problem and it, it really isn't. If the police could solve the problem, they would have solved the problem uh, in the neighborhood itself. Um, 
And so how do we think that we can solve the problems that we're dealing with at schools now with more police? It has to be uh, more mental health, more wraparound services to, to provide uh, the racial socialization that Dr. Wallace is talking about, uh, to deal with food deprivation, to deal with all the social ills. Before we can even get to the teaching the, the lesson plan, uh, these teachers have to uh, basically play social worker, police officer, mom, dad. They have to do all of those things. And I think that the other thing we haven't discussed uh, are, are the uh, lowering of teacher standards, uh, the low number of African-American teachers that we have, uh, and the, the total, what I would call uh, the total decay of public education now uh, in terms of, you know, it was a time when people wanted to be teachers. Remember uh, back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, it was honorable to be a teacher a lot of our biggest and brightest went into the educational profession. That's not happening anymore. When, when, when you, you, you gentlemen are around my same age. So back when I was at Indiana University in the, in the mid eighties, um, about 26% of all confirmed degrees were in education. You know what it is today? It's 6%. So mm. those are, things that we have to, those are some of the things we got to look at, you know, when we talk about we need real education reform and, and nobody's talking about it in the country, the, the fact that we need true educational reform um, that actually reaches back into the community and, and really solve some of these problems so that the so teachers are not expected to uh, try to solve these problems at the, at the schools. Hmm. As to the point uh, of trauma and how that plays out, and you mentioned uh, something uh, that I can definitely relate to not knowing your father. I never met my father. The first time I saw my father, I was 14 years old and it was he was in a casket. Uh, mm -hmm. Fortunately, I grew up in the home with a man, my great grandfather, my grandmother's parents adopted me and reared me. So I had it, but there were still all these questions that came along with him not being present in my life that I had to at some point answer, but let's talk about that particular, I mentioned this earlier about the uh, adverse childhood experiences and epigenetics, which is a major part of my research. I want to talk about 10 adverse, uh, adverse childhood experiences that not only impact how a child performs in school, but also impacts their health. And not just on a mental mm -hmm. level, but on a physiological level throughout life. Uh, there are 10 primary and I've identified at least 10 others, but 10 primaries. The first one is physical abuse. The second, verbal. Third, sexual, verbal abuse. Sex, the third, sexual abuse. The fourth, physical neglect. The fifth, emotional neglect. Number six is having a parent that is addicted to a controlled substance, specifically and especially alcohol. Uh, an incarcerated family member. The disappearance of a parent through divorce, death, or abandonment. A family member diagnosed with a mental illness. And number 10, a mother who is a victim of domestic violence. Each one of those aces count as a point or we refer to it as an ace. When you reach four points or four aces, you are 12 times more likely at some point in your life to attempt suicide. You're two and a half times more likely to develop certain illnesses uh, like type two diabetes, four times more likely to develop ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in America, four times more likely to develop cancer. We talk about cancer. We always talk about carcinogens. We always talk about what we're eating. The truth of the matter is when, when I began to study, study epigenetics and I actually began to study it to uh, uh, delve into the question of multi-generational trauma the transmission of trauma down generational lines, because in the nineties, they start talking about, it's been a hundred plus years since slavery and it's time to get over it. And so my question was, have we ever dealt with the trauma that came from 246 years of child slavery, 12 years of reconstruction, 10 years of black codes and convict leasing, 76 years of Jim Crow segregation. We're still dealing with mass incarceration, gentrification, and a bunch of other things that are still re-injury. So where did it come from? But in the process of studying epigenetics, I was introduced to the point of environmental stressors. And we come to find out that the most influential cause of disease, cancer, lupus, other diseases, environmental stress. So when these kids experience this, 
even after they move into adulthood, they're still genetically carrying the genetic tags or the epigenetic tags that came with the trauma that will influence how they behave. So some will become more sexually promiscuous. Others will become uh, more sexually docile or retreative. And then you'll have other type of behavior where you're saying, say, why are they taking all these risks associated to the trauma? And then you'll look at all these actual health outcomes. And we come to find out that a significant part of our issues with health, and we're looking right now, just in the last five years, the life expectancy of black men dropped three years. And while three years doesn't seem like a lot, it's huge in the statistical study of life expectancy. Three years dropping that fast is astronomical. And it is directly associated with stress. And we are not have we have never been more stressed as black men than we are now. And we have to understand this started as early as three and four and five years old. And so when we talk about the the the, the trauma. We're talking about kids who are probably coming to school traumatized, then being traumatized by the system in one way or another, and they're not being an outlet for them to deal with it. So it's absolutely imperative that we address this on that level that because, again, and the reason and how I got uh, connected, I did this for the Harris County Sheriff's Office uh, here in Houston. Harris County is the largest county and Houston is in Harris County. But um and the program that uh, brought me in was a reentry program. And we're trying to reduce recidivism. And we're, but the point you have to understand is the impact that is uh, experienced by the men. We, we, we talk a lot in the black community about 1.5 million black men missing. Well, I can tell you where 1.3 of them are at, prison. So you got 1.3, there's 1.5, know exactly where they're at. But we can't keep them out of there because they've been conditioned and institutionalized. That's the power of the subconscious that's been influenced since they were kids. They were literally primed for that. And that's and, and, and you, you couple that with the trauma and it's hard to reach. You ever looked at somebody and said, prime example, all they had to do was comply. Ah, there's there's instinctive behavior that goes down to uh, the most primitive part of the brain that totally shuts down the prefrontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex, which is where all your executive function, impulse control, all that stuff that makes you make good decisions gets shut down the moment that you have that response or that reaction. And black men almost live in it. And so what are we going to do about it? And so all these questions arise again, you know, this is a topic in and of itself, but mm -hmm. uh, that to answer your question as best as I could in the time allotted, we have a problem. <laughs> wow. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some of the, the data as well, um, that the majority recently, the, uh, Department of Justice said the majority of, of students who are being suspended and expelled are now black females. Um, and then I look at it and it says that the majority of teachers are white female or the majority of teachers are white females in schools where a majority of students are Hispanic, black, Asian, American Indian, Alaska Native. Um, then I have this other that says, this is from the National Bureau of Economic Research showed that black students who have one black teacher in elementary school are 13% more likely to enroll in college. Those who have two black teachers are 32% more likely to go to college. So my question to both of you is, is what can we do to get more talented and committed black educators, now I'm, I'm saying educators, not teachers, educators teaching in our public schools and in our community. Uh, well, that, that's a tough one, man. That is a tough one, Dr. Klee. Um, clearly, uh, when we have a, a demographic that has such a low number of African-American teachers and educators, obviously students see people that look like them. Um, and the, the teachers that are there, they have difficulty relating to each other, both the teacher and um, then you have bias. 
that's going on, bias with grading and bias with, with just interacting and socializing with, with, with the young person as Dr. Rick talked, you know, alienated and they, uh, they lose interest in school. I remember even myself losing interest in school because of that, as I talked about a little bit earlier. But, uh, you know, we have to pay teachers. First of all, we got to we've got to create a better environment for teachers to work in because we're losing teachers by the droves. And I don't have to tell both of you how many teach black teachers we've lost in the last 20 years. And right now I talk about us us, us being uh, in need of reform in education. Uh, when I look at my own school district, when I look around and see all the black teachers that are down here in Florida uh, are of retirement age, if they all decided to retire, you know, year, you talk about a shortage. You always hear about the teacher shortage now. Um, mm. we, would, we would be in very dire straits. I mean, it's so bad now that you've seen programs where they're willing to hire people with no degree in teaching to teach, uh, you know, by allowing uh, yeah. military or former military's families to come teach. And so we're doing things that devalue the, the position of a teacher because we're lowering the standards be, instead of raising the standards and paying more to attract better teachers. We're actually, you know, lowering the bar to be a teacher. You know, out, out in uh, Nevada, uh, you can be a, a, a uh, substitute teacher without any college credits at all. Mm. So. Uh, have to raise the salary that we got to create a better working environment for, in schools because we're just losing them by the by the droves i don't i don't have a magical solution to that but you have to pay more you have to pay a livable wage and salary because like i said earlier 26 percent of all confirmed degrees 30 years ago now we only have six percent of confirmed uh education degrees in in 2023 so it's a major problem that nobody's really dealing with or talking about, but um, you know, it has to be. There has to be a, a change in the conditions of teachers, um, and it, it has to be a better benefits, uh, a better pay. I, I concur. Um, having come from a high school that was literally 99.9% .9 black, we had almost, what, 4,000, close to 4,000 something students uh, when I graduated in 86 and had more than that the years before. Uh, we had two Latino students. Everybody else in that entire school was black, but 95% of the teachers were black. Mm -hmm. And they were there because they wanted to be. They was there because they saw a chance to impact us. And I look at the number of lawyers, engineers, uh, and professionals that came out of that school during that time. That, and we're all still connected. We stay real closely knit and we deal with each other. And it's like, man, we produced. And, and, and so I had read the same numbers that you talk about. And there's a direct correlation between being able to see someone like yourself in a professional influential position. Uh, and number one is, uh, it's, uh, what I can tell you is these black teachers see something in you. Uh, and, you know, I talk about, I don't know if you read my whole bio, but I talk about my teachers, the influential ones throughout school that saw something in me at different stages. My elementary school teacher, Miss Francois, inflected me. I write like Miss Francois right now today because she she told me nobody would ever know how intelligent I was because they couldn't understand my writing. And so she made me stay after school every day with her until I learned how to write legibly. And so I actually ended up writing to where I, I got teased a lot. You write like a girl. But <laughs> and then I got to middle school and Mr. Brewer demanded that we show up on time, that we do our work, that discipline was uh, this thing. And then I got to high school and Miss uh, Dewberry, which was my, turned out to be my 11th grade teacher, but found me in the ninth grade when she sat in for one of my teachers and she pulled me to the side. So I've listened to you talk. And she said, I'm going to keep up with you. And she was the most feared person in school. Kids would get her in school. The first day they would look at their schedule and they'd be lined up outside the counselor's office crying 
because they didn't want her. But she saw something in me. She would tell me the word can't doesn't apply to you. And these things stick because they are authoritative figures. But if everybody that's authoritative don't look like you, first and foremost, they don't care about you the same way they care. I think Malcolm X said it best. Only a fool expects his enemy to educate his children hmm. to compete against theirs. And you have to really think about this. This is a competitive world where we're going out and we're competing for jobs, we're competing for future. Uh, so I think that we have to start with the idea of educating outside of the system. We need to create and bring minds together to educate outside of the system. We also need to start pooling our resources to create institutions for our children that we can put them in an environment where the people who are excelling look like them so that they can strive and be because that anti-socialism thing that I talked about at the beginning is what you get when 75% of your teachers are white females. And, and, for a male, and for a black male, I want you to understand something. That's counterproductive in a number of different ways. I'm gonna give you this example, then I'm gonna turn it back over to you. When I was seven years old, no, I take it back, I was eight turning nine. My grandfather, my great-grandfather went to my great-grandmother and said, I got it from here. You no longer chastise him. You no longer uh, whip him. You no longer uh, discipline him. Anything he does out of line, you tell me. I take care of it from here. And when I was 12, I asked him why he did that. He says, if I continue to let you be dominated by her, you will grow up as a man and be dominated by women. You won't be able to lead. You won't be able to take on your role as a man. And you won't function well. At some point, you got to learn from a man. And so he took on that role. And so now you take a black male who is already naturally resisting a woman at a certain age. He doesn't want to be, his natural part of him doesn't want to be dominated by a woman. And then you make it a white woman on top of it. Mm -hmm. And you got, you got, you got all this friction and we don't understand why it's going on. We are moving so far away from the natural order of how our men operate that we see this and it's, I'm glad that you pointed out the fact that the, the most rapidly growing population in prison right now are black females, why? And you starting to see they're starting to funnel them through the school and prison pipeline. They are the most suspended mm -hmm. right now. And all that means is that's, that's, that's part of the uh, school to prison pipeline, suspension and expulsion. And so what we have to do is we have to look at how is that happening? And then we have to counter it. But in my opinion, the system is so broken now and we're moving to a, we're rapidly approaching a point where public education won't be what it was anyway. We're moving towards privatization of, of, of the mm -hmm. educational system. So we've already moved to where we are in the charter school era and the charter school era will eventually give away to complete privatization. But what happens in the charter school is they're pulling the brightest and the sharpest out of regular public schools and putting them in the yeah. charter schools because they get to hand select. And what happens to the schools after the, the, the hand-picked high performers are gone? You get low performance scores. What happens after a number of years of low performance scores? They close the school. And this is happening over and over again. And, and what's going to eventually happen is we're going to transition out to privatization. And what most people don't realize is while you can get arrested and ticketed for not sending your kid to school, there's no constitutional right for education. Right. And so we, you got, we, we, we've got to be ahead of the game. There's no right to education. Then they'll, they'll penalize you for it if you don't participate. But uh, I've uh, worked and I've actually participated in actually homeschooled some of my younger kids. And that's going to have to be another option as well. It's not easy because most parents are working. Yeah. But uh, homeschool kids perform at a higher level, a much higher level than publicly educated children. Okay, so we're well ready to close. Uh, uh, can either both of you uh, take about a minute to talk about, you know, how people like, how can they uh, purchase your books? How can they schedule you? How can they reach out to you to, to have you come and, and uh, do presentations and to share the, your, your knowledge and wisdom and experience? Can, can both of you take a like, little quick moment to do that? Or yeah, you can, you type, can. In, type it in the chat or something like that. Yeah, you can reach me at drmichaelblanchard.com. Uh, all of my books are on there. Uh, the email contact is on there. Cool. Uh, and you can reach me at support at rickwallacephd.link. I just typed it in. 
uh, there and you can get a list of the books. Uh, you can also work with my support team to set up uh, any type of speaking engagements, workshops, conferences, uh, anything like that. Uh, but that's the one stop shop, the support at Rick Wallace, uh, uh, support at Rick Wallace PhD dot link. And that's the easiest way. Then, awesome, rather than awesome. sharing 35 different links. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really appreciate your, you guys uh, taking the time and, and sharing your knowledge and wisdom and expertise with us. Uh, like I said, we, we will, um, uh, I will edit it and put it on, put it on the blog talk, on the, on the Wake Up Everybody blog talk. And I'm, 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 I, um, I hope people will uh, take you up and, you know, reach, you know, reach out to y'all and, you know, get your, your publications uh, kind of, you know, contact you to speak and come and do presentations because I, you know, we, we really don't have enough qualified, uh, people that can come out that are willing to come out and share their expertise with us. And, uh, you know, one thing that, I, that I've learned myself is that I, you know, I get more offers from outside of Indianapolis than I do locally. And, uh, I, I was talking to Babyface. Uh, Kenny Babyface Edmund, and he said the same thing. <laughs> you know, the, the Black Expo, and they reach out him, they don't, they yeah. want to, or they want to give him a little this or that. But then once he got out of here, you know, then it took off. You know. No, you're right. You're right, Dr. Lee. Uh, we don't we don't support our own. You know, in our own communities. Unfortunately, and my experience too. You know, my hometown of South Bend, and like you said, Indianapolis for, with Babyface. Uh, I remember that. You know. That him saying that uh, Indianapolis didn't offer him the street, so he became really big, you know? That's yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both. And uh, you guys have a great time. Oh, and tell people about the, the teachers, how they can uh, access the, the teachers. Oh, uh, I, Doc, you want to do it or you want me to do it? Yeah, you can reach us at www.theteachers.com. We have a bunch of uh, about 30 uh, previous episodes of it. Um, you can reach it there. Uh, you can also reach us on YouTube, both uh, the podcast as well as the teacher's soundtrack that has Dr. Rick Wallace explaining what education means uh, in the, before the uh, soundtrack begins. So you can reach us there, www.theteachers.com. Thank you both. So again, thank you, Dr. Michael Blanchard and Dr. Rick Wallace for a great conversation and some guidance, you know, on how to deal with this, uh, this trauma that we're experiencing and this disconnect that we're experiencing between uh, scholars and our community leaders. So again, thank you both. And I will check you guys, check, check in with you guys, and I will send y'all the link for the Wake Up Everybody broadcast blog talk. Thank you and have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Appreciate you. Talk to you later, Doc. All right. Definitely. We'll talk. Yeah. 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 They said I should give it up like yeah. that just ain't good enough. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.